Um, hi, everyone, and thank you for coming to the talk. Uh, the first thing I'd like to do is on behalf of, oh, thanks, um, on behalf of uh, all of the authors on this project to thank the program committee for recognizing our work. I hope that you won't all be disappointed. Um, I will start with a disclaimer just to set expectations. This is absolutely not the story of how we did everything right, everything worked, and now we're all done. Okay. Um, so if you're looking for the solution to the child welfare system, um, it's not provided here. <laughs> I was really surprised when I first started working in this area at just how many individuals are affected by the child welfare system. Recent estimates uh, say that roughly 37.4% of children will experience a Child Protective Services investigation by the age of 18. And in 2016, the current estimates show that the Child Protective Services agencies across the country fielded 4.1 million referrals, which were associated to 7.4 million children, which resulted in investigations or alternative service responses for 3.5 million children, and this is just in one year. So far from being a very rare problem, this actually impacts a lot of families around the country. In Allegheny County, Pennsylvania, which is centered on uh, Pittsburgh, I'm a faculty member at Carnegie Mellon, this is how I got on this, um, on this collaboration, the child welfare referrals, so that the calls come in, um, are screened by call screeners who use information about the allegation, so this is what the reporter provides to them, along with information that they can query from an integrated data system that Allegheny County has established. And the call workers, uh, job is to determine, based on this information, whether a particular referral should be screened in, in other words, investigated, or screened out. The primary goal of the work that I'm presenting here is to make better use of the integrated data system. So what the system contains, this is pretty unique to Allegheny County, is information on essentially all public services use, such as county jail, juvenile probation, public welfare, behavioral health problems, child welfare history, um, and demographic information on all residents of the county. And while call workers have been able to query the system um, as part of their decision-making process all along, it's very difficult to make use of all of this information effectively, especially given the volume of calls that they screen. So the issue is really that there's too much information to very quickly process, and the purpose of this project was to try to distill some of this information into a relevant risk score that could then be provided as a source of decision support uh, for the call center workers. I'll now describe um, parts of what became the Allegheny Family Screening Tool. Again, this is a work in progress, um, what the AFST is changes, and we're constantly revising um, what's going on, and we're getting ready for a new redeployment. Um, this entire project began with a county call for proposals in 2014, and there was a contract awarded to uh, some members of the research team, I was not yet involved, um, in fall of 2014. Since mid-2015, we've been working, or some part of the team has been working on developing this tool. The AFST was adopted and deployed uh, between summer of 2016 and really November when it became fully operational. Uh, after it became operational, we began a predictive bias evaluation. You'll see that there's a small and significant dot, which is where I joined the project. Um, and at this stage in the game, we are well into our redesign process process, um, but we're really open to any commentary that you may have on the basis of what you see here. So what is the AFST and what sorts of problems did we encounter along the way? So the first question that was encountered was, what should we predict? This is not a case where it's entirely clear what the prediction target should be. Um, the gold standard in most people's eyes would be serious maltreatment or neglect. If I could tell you which children are likely to experience uh, these adverse outcomes, that would be fantastic. However, this is not something that we directly observe. We observe something that's quite related, which is substantiation. When an investigation takes place, if it is found that there was a case of serious maltreatment or neglect by the uh, child welfare investigator, that would be a case of substantiation. But we were reluctant to adopt this as an outcome because it is a decision that is internal to the child welfare system. And we were worried about feedback loops that would result in us making predictions of our own decisions. So instead, we went with a proxy for serious maltreatment or neglect, which is out of home placement uh, within two years of a referral coming in. And this is among cases that were screened in. Um, in general, you only get to the placement stage if you are at some point screened in for investigation or services. 
The reason that we chose this outcome is because it's largely determined by the courts, not the child welfare system. So the family has access to a lawyer. I'm not saying everything always comes up roses, uh, but it is at least external to the core function of what the child welfare system does. We also had a re-referral model among cases that were screened out. So if we were to decide that a case should not be investigated, how likely is it to be re-referred to us uh, in the near future? Um, Unfortunately, this, uh, while this model did feature in the deployment, and I'll make a point of this later, I, uh, county leadership, after reflecting on it, has really determined that this was a mistake, that we should not have used a re-referral model, um, and that actually its use has really negatively impacted our ability to obtain buy-in from the frontline staff. So I'll focus mostly on the placement model. The data that we use this, uh, to construct this model um, was all referrals that came in to the Allegheny County um, Child Maltreatment Hotline from April 2010 to July 2014. And this comprises roughly 37,000 referrals, and our training data for the placement model consists of the roughly 20,000 of referrals that were screened in. Now, using just the screened in population, of course, has us encountering uh, critical problems that we um, have not yet risen to the challenge of, such as selective labels, treatment effects, covariate shift, we are aware of these problems and many others that exist, but um, it takes time to address all of them. In this data set, 13% of children were screened in for, of, of those who were screened in for investigation were placed outside the home within two years. So it's a 13% prevalence of the event we're trying to detect. The score that we developed wound up being on a 20 point scale, uh, with one being the lowest risk and 20 being the highest risk. And I learned a new term while working on this project. Many of you are familiar with deciles. If you want 20ths, those are called ventiles. Um, that's the scale that's presented here. Um, no, this is not a principal choice. Um, but what's shown in the bottom plot is the actual placement probability estimate. And the ventiles are even 5% quantiles of this distribution. So when I say that a child receives a score of 20, it means that they are in the top 20th of risk. There are also special score categories uh, that will become relevant later on, and these are the mandatory screen-in thresholds. I always put mandatory in quotes because we do not mandate any decisions on the part of the call center workers, but this is a place where we make strong recommendations. So in the initial deployment, if a case was assessed on somewhere between 18 and 20, which means it's in the top 15% of risk, it would be deemed mandatory and would require a supervisor to override uh, the decision. We'll see that that happens quite often. In the next deployment, we're considering lowering this threshold further. As part of this project, we, uh, we commissioned an independent ethical analysis, which I'll speak about a little bit. And also after the deployment um, actually started initially, we started looking into the predictive racial bias properties of the models. And so I'll talk briefly about these now. Um, what we generally found is most of the even basic notions of parity or fairness that have emerged in this literature are not satisfied by the models, and this is problematic. There's really lots of room for improvement. The independent ethical analysis was written by Tim Dare and Eileen Gambrell, and they identified several key issues and challenges um, with this work from an ethical perspective. They emphasized many of the issues that are coming up regularly as part of this conversation. I think the only one that they mentioned that hasn't featured in at least one of the talks is professional competence and training. But consent, privacy, error rates, stigmatization, racial disparities, resource allocation, these are all things that we talk about regularly. In the end, they did conclude that the implementation of the tool is ethically appropriate, and in fact, that they believe there could be significant ethical issues in not making the best use of the data that we can. On the predictive bias side, we, it doesn't take very long for us to find properties where we start to see questionable behavior. So here's the AFSD placement model, and what's being indicated by the height of the bars is the observed placement rate in each of the different categories. What we find in this case is not what you might think. Our model seems to overestimate risk for white children compared to black children, which is not the story you might expect. Uh, one way of seeing that is, for instance, a white child who receives a score of 20 on this 20-point scale is about as risky as a black child who receives a score of 18. We can also look at accuracy parity, which is a quality of uh, AUCs and error rate balance. This is for the, again, AFSD placement model. 
what we find is that the error rates are all over the place. We also find that we have much better predictive ability as indicated by the height of the ROC curve for certain groups compared to others. Interestingly though, the group for which we have the highest predictive ability is the unknown race group, which doesn't actually correspond in any meaningful way to a salient racial subgroup. And we don't have a very good explanation for why this is, though we have some hypotheses why we get this better predictive accuracy. We looked at other models. What can you pull off the shelf and will have the same issues as this original, um, should have said logistic regression with some variable selection model that underpins the original AFSD. Uh, when you fit a random forest or most other models, you'll also find some calibration issues, as we see here, though you don't always find the same error rate and balance issues that we found with the original AFSD placement model. Again, the tool was deployed before we conducted this analysis. Otherwise, we would have, of course, taken steps to try to better understand this and fix the issues. One point that I want to emphasize in this context is that false positive predictions, so when our model makes a false positive, do not necessarily correspond to false positive decisions. Um, one reason for this is that the decisions, uh, our model is just a decision support tool, but that starts to feel like a bit of a cop-out. The other reason is that we're predicting risk of placement. This is by far not the only consideration that we have when making screening decisions. It indicates risk for a bunch of other factors. We're really using it as a proxy. And just because a case doesn't result in placement doesn't mean it wasn't a good screen-in. So it's actually very difficult to reason about what these uh, error metrics really tell us about the quality of our decisions. I'd like now to present some of the results from the initial deployment. Um, so the tool went into deployment in August 2016. Again, the predictive bias assessment followed. Um, and what we find is that there's some correspondence between the decisions that were made and the AFST score that was displayed, but the decisions seem to be largely pinned to call worker assessments, and I'll explain to you the evidence that we have for that. And again, just as with building the models, um, there's lots of room for improvement here. So what do the call workers see? What the call workers see is a page that looks like this, where there is a score indicated from one to 20 that appears on the right. Now, the score isn't just based on the placement model. As I mentioned, initially this deployment was based on also using a re-referral model, which is not something that we will continue to use going forward, because re-referral is not really something that's central um, in assessing whether a case merits investigation. So for instance, the way that this score of 16 could have come about is the case could have received a placement score of 10, which is some, we do want to continue working on the placement model, a re-referral score of 16, and thus the call worker would see 16. Okay. Here's a chart of what the screening decisions look like uh, during deployment. Um, what I've shown on the x-axis is the actual placement score, but from what I've explained, you can interpret this as a lower bound on what the call worker actually sees. So if the placement score was higher than the re-referral score, they would have seen exactly what's indicated on the x-axis. Otherwise, they would have seen a higher score, which would have been the referral score. There were cases for which the score is recorded as zero, which means that the score was unable to be assessed, and there are many reasons for why that is. Um, you can ignore the blue and red cases. Those are ones that are either have an unknown status or are already active. The green cases are the ones that are screened out, so where it's determined that there should be no investigation and the purple cases are screened in. Indicated in black here is the mandatory screen-in range, and what you find is that there is a very high rate of screen-outs even in this mandatory range. So remember, I said that supervisors were able to override these decisions, and they were exercising the option to do so one quarter of the time. We can dig a little bit deeper into this um, using some information that was actually solicited from call center workers as part of the design. So call workers, prior to seeing the AFST score, but after hearing uh, the report, would provide a scale, would assess on a scale of one to three their perceived risk of the case and the safety that is posed to the children that are referred. And this is a scale from one to three. They, uh, in our data, we also combine this into a combined risk safety score, which is just a multiple of the two numbers. What we find is that there's essentially no association between the call worker's assessment of the risk of the case and our AFSD placement model. We also find that there's essentially no association between our risk model and the safety assessment of the call workers. 
What we do find is when we look at the combined call worker risk safety score, so the product of the numbers that they provided, that there is a very strong association between the decisions that they made and this, their own worker assessed um, safety score. One thing I want to draw your attention to is that even in cases where the call worker assessed the case as being as the highest risk and uh, present danger, there's still a screen out rate, and I cannot explain why that's happening. So to conclude, um, in our paper, we think a lot more critically uh, about fairness. I'm really glad that Chelsea gave her talk yesterday as some of the things she mentioned really resonate with some of the things we um, said in our paper and have observed in practice. But the last thing I wanna do is just put this tool in context. And I wanna end on the note that fairness is really a process property, especially in these cases where it's being used as a decision support tool. This, is, this box or the AFST is not the new process. The new process is just an augmentation of what existed before with some additional decision support to hopefully allow case workers, recall workers, to make better use of the data. And in the grander scheme of things, it's an even smaller part still. Thank you. Hi, I'm Kathy O'Neill. Um, I use this example all the time. Thank you for your bravery in coming to talk about it. Um, I would like to go bring us back to the very beginning um, where you said you discarded the use of substantiation as a, as a target variable. I just don't understand that. I mean, there are feedback loops everywhere we're looking. Um, so what particular feedback loop were you trying to avoid? So I wasn't personally involved in that decision, so my answer would be spe uh, speculative at best and just based on some of the conversations that have followed. Uh, but it's our understanding from our child welfare collaborators that there is some indication of racial bias, for instance, at the substantiation or at the investigation decision point. And that's something that we really wouldn't want to introduce into our system. There's less evidence of that um, at placement. Again, this is my understanding, and there may be um, contravening evidence as well. Okay, and that, but isn't that the reason you discarded um, re Recalling in? Uh, referral. Re referral. We discarded re referral because it wasn't deemed to be actually very useful for the screening decision because the call workers aren't actually thinking of this as a question of will we be called back? There are many reasons for why re referrals might happen, such as someone is upset at their neighbor or their daughter in law and things like that. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Hi, I was hoping um, you can share a bit more about the working with a community aspect, whether it's working with the call workers themselves or even any of the families or children um, and sharing with us what it was like to get in, to really get deep into understanding these communities so mm -hmm. you can better serve them. Yeah, uh, so the team has spared the community from me as I am a statistician, um, but that's certainly something that we're very interested in and the county leadership did make efforts to meet with individuals who are affected by the system, advocates, really to bring the community on board in an effort like this as their response is extremely important. Um, the project team also recently received KDD impact funding to better probe some of the community concerns around specifically the use of algorithmic methods um, in decision support context in the child welfare system. So these are issues that uh, we really want to understand more deeply and something that we take very seriously, even if I'm not the person doing most of that work. Hi, thanks very much. Um, I was wondering if there's empirical work about potential demographic disparities in terms of how these calls arrive um, in the system. You mentioned the selective labels problem and what you thought were uh, potentially promising avenues or if perhaps the remedy lies more in kind of like community-based interventions or uh, investigating these community dynamics further. So there's definitely a rich literature that seems to indicate that African-American children are much more likely to be uh, referred. Um, it's unclear in terms of the entire process really where these disparities um, come up and where they can't be accounted for by other explanatory factors. For instance, socioeconomic status tends to be a great equalizer um, in a lot of these things, but there's certainly a literature and our, ch uh, our child maltreatment collaborators um, have contributed to that work and are, of course, informing our efforts. 